David Newman. Welcome to my series of interviews that we're calling Getting Started. Uh, we're focusing on how people that inspire us got started in their own careers and uh, what advice they can pass along to the rest of us. And I'm so thrilled to have as my guest today, Peter Greenberg, who I can only describe as the foremost travel journalist in the world and an extremely accomplished person in so many different fields, including uh, television development. Uh, Peter, welcome to the broadcast. Happy to be with you, David. And of course, uh, given the state of current technology, you're in California, and here it's about nine o'clock at night in Istanbul. Wow. How is Istanbul doing during the pandemic? Well, the good news is that they're open to Americans. They're having their own case problems with, with the spikes in, in COVID-19, but people are behaving. They're wearing the masks. Um, I'm certainly wearing mine, with the exception of right now when I'm talking to you. Um, and uh, we're out here doing one of my television specials. So uh, a lot of Americans happen to be here right now. In fact, a lot of Americans moved here during the pandemic because it was cheaper for them to live here and work remotely than to stay in the States. Really, that's fascinating. Um, has it, uh, is it, is it the same Turkey that you're used to visiting before? Is it, does it have all of the, uh, does the pandemic take, take anything away from the experience? Well, there is a curfew uh, between nine o'clock at night and five in the morning. Um, it's a real curfew on Sunday when everything shuts down. But uh, if you're a foreign passport holder, which I am, it doesn't apply to you, at least uh, in terms of access to different things. So uh, now remember, when you ask it, is it the same turkey? I go back to the days of Midnight Express. So, <laughs> oh my. so in, in, in that way, it's delightfully not the same turkey. In one way, you're absolutely correct. In other ways, it has a way to go. That's great. Well, Peter, I think I was telling you that I created this series of interviews because whenever I'm asked to speak somewhere, the questions from young adults are always about getting started. How did I get started? They're trying to get started. What advice do I have? What can I pass along to them? They may have a dilemma. And it occurred to me when I was preparing for our interview that you have what is probably the dream job for a billion people. I mean, who can think of a more exciting and interesting way to spend their life professionally than to travel to the coolest places in the world and document and journal about those things, you know, for, for the public. Um, and, and so when I ask you the question of how you got started, I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna fascinate so many people because there are a lot of people that, that have a big sense of FOMO when they watch you do your job. Well, let me, let me put things in perspective here. I am not on the beach with Robin Leach. Myth number one exposed. Number two, I am not drinking wine glasses with size zero women. Myth Wait a minute. Exposed. I've seen on some of the specials that you've had that you have been clinking, uh, you know, clinking those glasses with very attractive women and men for that matter. So uh, I, I have to dispute you journalistically. <laughs> well, when I tell you how I got started, I may, dis I may disabuse you of that notion because... Uh, I didn't start, people make a classic mistake in many cases when they talk to me about uh, my transitions and my, my, my different jobs that I've held. And the first question that they ask, which, which usually evokes a, a rather angry answer for me is, how did you make the transition from journalism to travel? And I have to stop them and say, no, I'm a journalist. I'm an investigative reporter. All I've done was master the art of applying my investigative reporting techniques to the largest industry in the world, which happens to be travel and tourism. So that started back with me starting in journalism at the age of 17. And what were you doing at the age of 17? And, and how did that start? Well, in order to answer that question, I got to go back a few years earlier. I'm born and raised in New York City. I'm a product of the public school system. And when I was in, in high school, um, you know, the Board of Education then, as I presume now, had a budget problem, and you were only allowed to apply to three universities when it was time to apply to college, other than a city college in New York or a state university. So, of course, you applied to your impossible school, your maybe school, and your slam dunk school. My impossible school was Wesleyan in Middleton, Connecticut, uh, which in those days was all, was all boys. Uh, my maybe school, because a couple of kids went there ahead of me who were a year, of me in, a year ahead of me in school, was Wisconsin. And then my slam dunk school, can't miss school, was NYU downtown in New York. And 
here's how it all happened. I went to my interview at Wesleyan. My dad drove me out. I was interviewed by a guy with his tortoiseshell glasses and his Guy Lombardo bow tie who looked at my application and said, so, Mr. Is it Greenberg, you really want to come to Wesleyan? And, of course, the subtext there was Jewish. Oh, my. Wow. And, and, oh, yeah. And, of course, I wow. did the best I could in the interview. Then I went to Wisconsin, went to the campus, fell in love with it, loved it. I applied there. And then, of course, there was the slam dunk university down in downtown New York called NYU Downtown. And then, of course, April of my senior year came the waiting for the letters. And the first letter I got was from Wesleyan. It was the most beautifully crafted letter I had ever read. It talked about my, my standing in the community and what a, what a role model I was. Somewhere in that letter, David, there were four words. I couldn't find them, but they were there. And those four words are, you're not coming here. Um, and oh it, was, it was a beautiful rejection letter. Uh, and then NYU downtown turned me down. Yikes. Well, and I'm surprised that was your slam dunk school because obviously today it's an extremely elite school and very right then, it, it wasn't on the radar. And then I, I should also tell you, I did not test well in high school. You know what I got on my math SATs? Hmm. Here it comes 437. Wow. Here's what I got on my on my English, 507. I mean, please. So I don't know how the gods conspired but Wisconsin accepted me. And I'm sitting here today in, in Istanbul uh, as a tribute with all thanks delivered to the University of Wisconsin because they were responsible, not just for my education, but they were responsible for my career in journalism. And the reason for that is at the age of 17, I went off to Madison, Wisconsin. I mean, I had no clue what I was doing there except I was going to get a BA, whatever the hell that was. And there were 33,000 students there. Now it's close to 50,000. But then there were 33,000, which was a lot. And I was told quite, I mean, quite correctly that you're going to get lost here unless you can find an, an, an affinity, a group to join. So I was given a choice, uh, pledge a fraternity or join the college newspaper. So I dutifully went down to fraternity row. And there they were, these, these girls in their knee socks, saddle shoes, and villager outfits, standing in the front of their sorority house singing, Daddy Wanted Me to Be a Kappa. I took one look at that, and I ran to the college newspaper. Now, you have to understand that at that time, uh, the University of Wisconsin was the most, and I didn't know this, okay? I didn't, there was no Google. It, Google wasn't around. I couldn't Google it. The University of Wisconsin was the most active and the most violent anti-war campus in America against the Vietnam War. And and I showed up at the college paper, like, hi, I'd like to join the paper, on a day where basically there was a Dow Chemical recruiting officer on the campus. We all know that Dow Chemical in those days was responsible for napalm. Napalm, napalm right. And, and the, the, the student body made a huge protest, so much so that it ended up in a police riot, and 165 people were in the hospital. I show up at the college paper, and the college paper's offices, all the windows were broken because they were a target of the police. There was tear gas in the room, and I just walked in there saying, can I join your paper? And, <laughs> and I think I said it just like that. And, and there was only one person left there, and he said, well, yeah, because everybody else is in the hospital, so you got to cover this. So I wrote a terrible story. It had no structure. It The grammar, so, it was the worst, but they put it on the front page. They had nothing else to do but do that. And I was living in a dorm. Uh, that student paper, by the way, had a bigger circulation than the city newspapers. It was really the paper of record. And so I woke up the next morning, and as I got out of bed, everybody said, hey, man, nice story. And I said, wow, this is cool. I like this recognition. And so I devoted myself at that point to living at the paper and never letting school interfere with my education and covering what then was an evolving and, and, and booming story of the campuses in America in revolt. Uh, and, and I did that for the next year and a half. And then here comes the fun part. Uh, does anybody here know what a stringer is in journalism? 
Well, I do, so because, I, I do because I'm old, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm not well, sure. You know, it's it's one of those terms really literally rooted in uh, in another century, right? Right. So I will tell you what a stringer is. It's the lowest of the low in journalism. It's where you are basically not hired. You're not on the masthead. You don't have any identification cards saying you work there. But you're the stringer for a news organization. It could be a newspaper, could be a news magazine, could be a network or a radio station. And you're maybe the stringer in Des Moines, Iowa. And God forbid a train derails there, then you're the guy who files the story until the big guns from that paper or a news organization can get there. That, and, and I got the job as the campus stringer for Newsweek. Now, keep in mind, prior to my arrival, the campus stringer for Newsweek's job was once every six months, they were asked to do a roundup story on whether culottes were back on campus. I mean, we're really talking crap. Um, well, we had the National Guard on campus with fixed bayonets and armored personnel vehicles, and they weren't leaving. We had a permanent cloud of tear gas between Monday and Friday over the Library Mall in Madison. We were front page news. So I got the job as stringer, but it was all front page news. And within the next year, even though I was still in school and attempting to you know, pass courses like chemistry, which was pretty pathetic, uh, I got hired as the youngest correspondent in the history of Newsweek, not as a travel correspondent, but covering the world from Madison, Wisconsin. Wow. Uh, so it, it sounds like you made the most of the, of the special opportunity that you had. Do you recall getting any feedback from your editors at that time? that you remember in the way of a critique or, or something like that? Well, it was more than that. I, I first had to understand how to get their attention and then give them ideas. And the rhythm of the news magazines in those days was the one day of the week they were bored and doing nothing was Monday because that was the day that the, the magazine hit the stands. By Tuesday, they were already planning the next week's issue, and then it got crazier and more intense as the week went on. So in those days, I really wish those days came back, all the airlines, American, TWA, United, Continental, had something called student standby fares, right? That was like the, their cheapest economy fare. You got to pay half off as a student, but if there was a seat on the plane, you'd go. So remember, I'm from New York. Newsweek's in New York. Uh, my parents are in New York. So I would buy these very cheap student standby tickets and fly to New York on a Sunday night skip out of class on Monday and go to the office at Newsweek with my stringer card to get me in the building and walk the 12th floor and meet with every editor I could who had nothing else to do that day and give them story ideas. I realized without story ideas, they'd never know I, I existed because I was where? West of the Hudson, right? Anybody west of the Hudson, they didn't care about. So I made my presence known. I had a place to sleep at my parents' apartment. I go down there and that Monday, by Monday afternoon at five o'clock, I was back at the airport flying back to Madison, but I, I would go back to Madison with a story assignment. They never gave Stringer stories assignment, but I kept on working the room so much that they, they actually thought I worked there full time. So they kept on giving me assignments and that's how it started. That's wonderful. That's, um, that's a great and very inspiring story because again, it seems like you were very enterprising and you were taking maximum advantage of the access that you did have. Peter, as you know, this is a live platform and we've got, you've got fans, it shouldn't surprise you, all over the world who are saying hello. Titusville, Chicago, St. Petersburg, uh, Grand Junction, Sydney, uh, Edinburgh, um, uh, just a, a, a plethora of comments. Uh, people just saying, uh, like uh, Peter saying, great to see you today. Hello from Palma. Uh, hey, sir, hope all is well, Peter. This is from maybe somebody you know, Frazier Ramsey. Dr. Quinones is saying hi. Cleveland saying hi. LA oh, saying right. hi. We got, we got, uh, you've got fans everywhere. Um, Peter, as you, as you, 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 you told a very inspiring story at the very beginning. Tell me about when things went wrong in that process and how you coped with it and how you learned from it. Well, when I first started working for Newsweek, I was 20 years old. Uh, they sent me out to, to California when I was a junior uh, to be an intern in the LA Bureau. Then when I, when I came back as a senior, they sent me out to Houston, which was a bureau they thought was dying, um, to work there. And 
imagine I was given um, the opportunity uh, of covering Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Arkansas. I had a ponytail. I drove a VW bus, and I had to convince your, everybody. Your last name was Greenberg. You know, I mean, you got that part. Uh, and I had to convince everybody that I actually worked for the magazine. It was it was amazing. But some of the best stories I ever did was when people then finally realized I did work for the magazine, how they turned things around and became some of the best things I've ever done. Uh, look, a lot of things go wrong, and they're going to go wrong. The key to success for me was how I adjusted. Uh, it wasn't because, the, look, in journalism, anytime you make plans, that's suicidal. I mean, forget it. Not going to happen. Um, and the other five-letter word other than plans that I hated and learned to hate was a word called later. Anytime I used that word in a sentence, I was screwing myself. So the, what I had to learn was that you needed to get up. And remember, I was on the West Coast working for Newsweek. So uh, I had to learn to get up at four in the morning to beat them to the office by phone. And I had to realize that I had to stay up later at night to be able to get stuff in there so they'd see it the next morning. So I perfected the art of the four hour a night sleep, which I still do today. Uh, that's it. I'm only I sleeping four hours a night. I so wish that I could do that, Peter. Do you think it's do you think it's your nature or do you think you just disciplined yourself into that? I think it's a little bit of both. But right now, I mean, I have an alarm clock, but I never use it. I mean, my body, the, the thing that really pisses me off is on Saturdays and Sundays, my body doesn't know it's Saturday or Sunday, and I'm still getting up for, you know, so, but it, you know what? It's worked for me. It works for me because if you look at what I do in, in, the, in the global nature of things, it's always nine o'clock somewhere in the morning, and someone's always looking for you. And if you're generating your own story ideas, and 80% of the stories I do are those ideas, uh, then you're constantly putting out the very fires that you set. So you can't complain. Right. Um, I want to invite people in the audience to ask a question of Peter, which I will pass along. So we're getting so many comments from all over the world and compliments. If you do have a question for Peter, I'm more than happy to relay it for you. So just put it into the comment section. Peter, I'm always fascinated by this. It's kind of a spiritual question. Looking back, when you were a child, was any of this foreshadowed? Did you did you ever explicitly know what you wanted to do, or 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 now looking back, do you go, oh yes, I obviously was inclined to these things? I was the son, and still am the son, of a doctor. I was supposed to be a doctor. Uh, everybody expected me to, to do what my dad did, and I used to go to his office and when I was a kid and put on the white the white jacket and wear the stethoscope and make believe I was actually treating people. Um, and I'll tell you this story. And this is when I realized that being a doctor was not going to work for me. I was 12 years old in junior high school. It was Easter vacation. My father's receptionist was on vacation. So I, as a dutiful son, was, in, was basically told, you're going to go to the office and answer the phones while he's making rounds at the hospital. So I took my school books with me because I was going to read them at the office, right? Forget it. And one of the courses that we had to take in junior high school was hygiene. Anybody remember hygiene? Well, the book that we had for that text was a book that told you how to recognize diseases that had long since been eradicated. Rickets, berry, berry, scurvy, scarlet fever. Well, we had to study all this stuff. So I had this book. And but the minute my dad left the office and he had no patients scheduled, he said, lock the door, just answer the phones. And his last admonition to me was, and don't play with the equipment. <laughs> so, so the minute the door closed, of course I was playing with the equipment. I put the white lab coat on the stethoscope. I was having fun with the fluorescent machine, you name it, the fluoroscopes. And all of a sudden, I can't make this up, loud sirens out in front of the building, loud banging on the door. And I open the door wearing this white lab coat with a stethoscope, and there is an ambulance driver, a hysterical mother, and her 15-year-old daughter in convulsions, and they wheel her in, doctor, you must help us. Oh my, oh God. Wait. And you're wearing the, you're wearing oh, the outfit. And I was tall for my age. So I, I wheel them into the examination room, and, and, and I immediately try to call my dad, but he's somewhere on the rounds in the hospital, they can't find him. This is way before cell phones are texting. And, and the woman is saying, doctor, you must come in here. So I, <laughs> I go in 
And I figure, okay, I must find out what the symptoms are because I used to watch my dad do that. So I said, well, tell me where it hurts. And she told me, and, I, and I'm like tapping her stomach. Does this hurt? Does this hurt? Like, I have no clue. And every time she tells you where it hurts, I say, okay, moment. And I run back into the reception's office and I open up this stupid hygiene book and I'm looking for symptoms. So I immediately ruled out berry, berry and scurvy. Okay, we're doing well. Then, oh yeah, it, it got crazy. And on, I kept on coming back, and now she's saying she's nauseous and about to throw up. I go back and I open up the book again, and there it was on page 68, appendicitis. Oh, my and I God. Back in, and remember, the ambulance is waiting outside. And oh, I said, wheel her up to Mount Sinai Emergency Room, only four blocks away. Tell them, operate immediately. It's appendicitis. And they wheel her out. The siren goes off. About four minutes later, my dad comes back in the office and he sees me wearing the, the outfit and the says, he says, what are you doing? I said, dad, listen, something just happened. I'll explain the outfit later. Here's what goes on. And he goes, you did what? I said, it's on page 68. Look, it's appendicitis. And, and he, he calls the hospital. They can't find that. They finally found, found her in the emergency room. He gets some resident on the phone who says, no doc, it's just gas pains. I said, dad, it's page 68. I'm telling you it's appendicitis. Well, guess what? My dad ran over there. It was appendicitis. That's they just operated. Annoying. Wait, wait, wait. They operated. They saved your life. And from that moment on, everybody was giving me toy doctor bags with candy pills. <laughs> However, it was then time to go to high school. And the high school that I applied to in New York City, you can apply to a number of specialized high schools, as you know, music and art, performing arts and Stuyvesant and Bronx science. I wanted to go to music and art because they had the cutest girls. My parents wanted me to go to Bronx Science because they promised 100% college admission. So it's now time to take the test for both of these schools. So I go to take the test from Bronx Science. Now, many of you will remember questions like this on similar exams that you had to take. If a train leaves Philadelphia going 30 miles an hour, heading west, and another train's heading east, at what point do they meet? Okay. That was not on this test. What was on this test at Bronx High School of Science was if a train is heading 30 miles an hour carrying 200 tons of super liquid cooled hydrogen at minus 64 Celsius, I was lost beyond hope. And I remember I was operating, there was about 200 questions on this test. You had your number two pencil. I'm on question number 12 when I hear 10 minutes, 10 minutes. I'm dead. So I said, I have nothing else left to lose. Remember, number two pencil. I just randomly filled in holes, little filled in little circles, and handed my book in. Now it's time to take the test for music and art. And I'm taking the written test. It's history and social studies and culture. I am acing this. I am whipping through this so fast. I'm winning the, I'm winning the prize. And 15 minutes before the test is done, I'm done. I stand up. I hand him my little blue book and the professor goes, where are you going? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you've finished the written test. Now it's your time for your audition. Nobody told me I had to audition, oh, wow. right? Stupid me, high school of music and art. I played the piano. They bring me into a room with three East German piano teachers. <laughs> Seriously, right? literally East German? Well, let's put it this way. Hello, Mr. Greenberg, what have you chosen to play for us today? Okay, I rest my case. And I hadn't chosen anything. So I said, oh, it's an original composition. <laughs> and I sat there and vamped, and I'm losing all sense of time. And finally I said, find a coda and end this thing, because this is hopeless. Da -da 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 -da. I ran home, I'm dead. Well, guess what? I got into music and art, and I was a national merit semifinalist in science at the Bronx High School of Science because all my answers were great. I didn't know anything. That's, that's and, astonishing. And you know what the answer was for my parents? You're going to Bronx Science, where I then proceeded to fail every possible pre-med course imaginable for college. And that answers your question, what was I ordained to do that never happened? Dr. Greenberg. <laughs> well, you know, the, the medical profession's loss is the travel industry's gain and the and journalism's gain, I should say, more more specifically. So things I'm glad things worked out. Um, I wanted to pass along. There's a, a 
there were some uh, uh, questions that came in, and now, of course, I've lost my spot. Uh, here we go. A couple of them. Um, Michelle Alexander was asking, you see, she says, I love your website, Peter Greenberg. What is the thing that surprises you most about reporting on COVID and traveling? Well, the thing that surprises me the most is how stupid Americans are. I have to say it. I mean, look, it's basic common sense. Pre-pandemic, currently pandemic, and post-pandemic. And it's amazing to me how many people still don't understand what they should be doing in terms of their behavior. I have a friend of mine who called me up on the phone about two months ago and he said, I'm so angry, I can't believe it. They threw me off the plane and they made me overnight in Dallas and I missed my other flight. I couldn't get to the airport I wanted to do. I had to go to another airport. It cost me $200 to get my car out of another airport. I'm so mad. I said, let me ask you a question. Why did they throw you off the plane? Because I'm not wearing a goddamn mask. I said, well, that's why they threw you off the plane. And you know, he just will not understand why that's a good idea, right? When I fly, I wear a double mask, right? I'm not trying to flaunt the rules. I'm trying to enhance them. And, mm -hmm. and so what amazes me, here we are, the largest industry in the world, travel and tourism, right? It's one out of every 10 jobs. It's one out of every five new jobs, assuming there'll ever be any new jobs. Uh, it's 93 countries totally depend on travel and tourism for their GDP. It's a slam dunk. They also depend on it to put food on the table for their people, which is not so much fun right now, a lot of places around the world. So my job is not to promote travel. God, God forbid I would ever do that. You'd laugh me off television. My job is not to sell travel. My job is to report on the process of travel so that I can give you the information that you need so that you yourselves can make intelligent decisions about your travel choices. End of discussion. But that involves safety, security, telling the truth, lying with numbers, lying without numbers. I mean, all fire safety, you name it. And right. so that's the kind of reporting I'm doing as opposed to lovely London and beautiful Bermuda. Right. Um, Lady Boss 62 has a very good question. Was there any one story that you covered that you feel affected you the most personally? Ooh, a couple of them actually. Um, and this goes back, nothing to do with travel. I mean, in, in the traditional sense. Uh, back when I was covering, this is going to date me now, uh, the Gary Gilmore story for Newsweek. Anybody remember Gary Gilmore? If you don't, Norman Mailer wrote an amazing book called The Executioner's Song. They actually turned it into a movie with Tommy Lee Jones and Rosanna Arquette. But Gary Gilmore, for those of you who don't know, was the first man executed in the United States in about 30 years. Uh, and he happened to pick the one state that when they decided to execute him, did it the old fashioned way, firing squad. Um, and I was there covering that story for Newsweek. But at the same time, I was commuting back to LA every five or six days because I was working on another profile story on a comedian that many of you might still remember, Freddie Prinze. Freddie Prinze uh, being at that point, the number one star on American television. He had that show Chico and the Man. And I would come back to LA, we'd sit with a tape recorder and do all the interviews, and then I'd go back to Salt Lake City for the Gilmore story. Well, at the middle of January of 1977, talk about dating myself, I was there when the firing squad got him and, and killed Gary Gilmore. Uh, and when that was over, which was pretty horrendous, I got on a plane and flew back to LA to finish my interviews with Freddie Prinze. I, went to, I got to LA, went to bed and at four o'clock the next morning got a phone call that freddie prince had just killed himself and put a gun in his mouth actually put a gun in his head and and blew his brains out uh and that was a story that that affected me very much because i had actually had the last interview with him and in that interview he was giving me so many signals that he wanted to kill himself but i was not in a position to understand those signals until i read the transcripts in context later on and that was very frustrating for me because you always want to ask yourself the obvious question, was there anything I could have done before that happened? And, when, uh, do you remember anything specifically when you read the transcripts that was like your tip off that helped you? Well, tip off day? after the fact, sure. Yes. He would say things, it, it would be an aside. He'd say things like, you know, I told my mom if I did that, I'd have to kill myself. <laughs> you know, oh. I mean, it's like things like that. Um, and but when now you read them after the fact, and there's one after another, and now you start putting the pieces together, and it, it was pretty sad. 
Um, I can imagine. Um, the, uh, one of our top commenters, Share Share, says, "With with all the travels, where would you say is the best place to retire?" <laughs> Interesting question. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to give you my metric because people are always asking me what's my favorite place. Uh, that's like asking me my favorite airline. I don't have one. I have a favorite airline based on individual routes, right? If you want to ask right. me what my favorite airline is between Cleveland and New York, I can tell you. But that may not be my favorite airline to go from New York to Chicago uh, right. for all the obvious reasons. However, about favorite places to retire, it's my same metric about favorite places. And that is, my. I have about 20 favorite places, but my metric is where I sleep the best. That's my that's my metric that's because where you, where you sleep the best is where you think the best. It's where you create the best. It's where you love the best, and it's the it's the place that you try to replicate every time you leave it, wherever you're going, because you always remember where you sleep the best. And so I have to tell you, the best place to retire has to be under the same metric where you sleep the best. Right. And for you, where would that be, Peter? I mean, I don't see you ever retiring, frankly, but. But uh, where do you sleep the best? I, I sleep the best where I've always slept the best, and that's on Fire Island in New York. That's a nice place. I've never visited, actually. But yeah, uh, I've been but, there. Thank you, Mom and Dad. I've been there since I was six months old. Um, and that's where I grew up. For those people who know it, as a child, you have your youth, your freedom, and, and your independence, and your innocence. And every time I go back there, and I go back there a lot, I relive the youth, the independence, the freedom, and the innocence because that's never left. That's very cool. Peter, one of the ways that you stand out as an inspiring person in my life is, you know, the, if you look in the dictionary under indefatigable, there would be a picture of Peter Greenberg. I mean, I, the, your energy level that you, you bring it at all times, you know, whenever I've seen you. And uh, now making that making it more uh, surprising to me that uh, that you sleep only four hours a night. Although I'm not surprised by that too. I want to share with my readers that, or no, my my readers, my uh, my viewers <laughs> that um, my readers too, but my viewers that actually I I met Peter first. I believe that we first met when I was a White House fellow, and as a group of fellows, we visited L.A. and you were attending a party or something or other, and that's how I originally met. You. And then after I served my fellowship in the White House, um, I met you because you were, in addition to already being a, a quite famous travel journalist, you were also running development at MGM Television. And uh, you had a, you had a, a wonderful uh, uh, reputation and track record there. And so you were doing essentially two full-time jobs. And I'm coming back to that question about energy. And, and you were managing it pretty well. I mean, it was a seven-day-a-week uh, professional life you had. And you, on weekends and holidays, you were, you know, doing your travel while I, while the rest of us might have been just taking a breather. But how? where does that energy come from? Do you have a regimen? Do you have certain things you do to just keep that battery charged at a high level? I do. And I actually got it. I inherited it from my mom. Uh, every night before she went to bed, she would make a list of everybody she wanted to call the next day. But this is the interesting uh, part of that. The list that she made was not business related. It was just people she wanted to talk to or people she hadn't talked to in a while. So I have a list every day of about 80 people I want to talk to. But of those 80 people, only 20 are business related. The other 60 are people I'm just keeping in touch with because uh, – you know, people are always thinking that when you're calling them, you want something. For those 60 people, the only thing I want to do is say hello. And and that's honest and that's genuine. And out of those conversations come amazing stories and, 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 and common ground. And every once in a while opportunities. But there's no Machiavellian agenda here. It's simply that I keep in touch with everybody. And I believe that that's really, I mean, I used to, I'll tell you this. And this got me in trouble at Newsweek. Once a year at Newsweek, I would throw a party. I would literally have a party for 800 people. Who are those 800 people? Everybody I ever interviewed who I liked, all right, without regard for who they were or what they did or their politics. So we had some pretty wild parties. 
we had drug dealers and DEA agents. We had Russian spies and State Department people. We had, um, you name it, I mean, we had hookers because I had interviewed them. And I mean, it was wild. And one night we had a party and nobody at Newsweek ever wanted to come to my party. They thought it was, a, it was sending the wrong message. Well, one night uh, I'm having a party, one of these parties, and in the middle of the party, uh, about eight people wanted to play touch football at night. So everybody got their cars out and put the lights out. It was like Lambeau Field. And they're playing touch football. And all of a sudden, a limousine pulls up and like comes right between them. The door opens up. And who decided to come to my party? Catherine Graham. Kay Graham. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. And wow. as she parted the Red Sea through this football game coming into my front door, the only things I could think about were two words, career over. <laughs> and, and guess Actually, what happened? You know, I, I don't want to spoil the outcome of the story, but I would have had a very different prediction based on the scene you just set. But, but keep going. Well, let me continue the scene and see if your prediction holds true. 40 minutes later, she's sitting in my backyard at a pool table, excuse me, at a ping pong table. And there were three hookers there from Detroit because there's a reverend in Bobby, uh, oh, what was Bobby's last name? But Bobby was, it was a former pimp in Detroit who turned into a minister in Inglewood, California. And Bobby brought his old group, right? And I told him he could bring them as long as they didn't work the room. And <laughs> Well, presumably and, they were retired uh, from well, that. Well, not necessarily. They mm -hmm. were still making friends, but they weren't working that night. But here's Kay Graham sitting at this ping pong table with three black hookers going, hi, Kay Graham, and what do you do? And that was when I said, career really over. <laughs> and you want to know something? She had the best time. Oh, she I'm sure. She had the best time. I'm and, sure. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, and, and nobody from Newsweek ever stiffed me again. I, I met her when I was a White House fellow, and, you know, she reminds me of a certain, you know, when you get to a certain level of wealth, power, and sometimes fame, many times it brings out the best in people. You know, sometimes it brings out the worst, but many times with somebody like Kay Graham, it brings out the best because she had nothing to prove to anyone. And she, you could tell she genuinely liked and admired people. And so, you know, just like a lot of, I mean, you must, you, you know, you, you obviously uh, meet a lot of wealthy and powerful people all over the world. A lot of them are really down. You know, they, they get it. They're, they're like, they, they love life. They love the world. They, they, they have a, a humility about them because they're sort of over all the ego thing of accomplishment or proving anything. And uh, she just immediately struck me as a person that, oh, yeah, she would have much rather been at Peter Greenberg's party with all those interesting people than a bunch of stuffed shirts at the country club somewhere. You well, know? What, really, what really defined her is what my mother once told me that I should be. And I'm still striving to be that way, but she did it. My mom once told me it's more important to be interested than interesting. And Kay Graham was interested. And that's what really kept the conversation going. She really was. Did you also meet, uh, um, I'm blanking on his name, of course, the super famous editor-in-chief under her at Washington Are you Post? talking about oh, the guy who then went to work at the Washington Post ben later Bradley, on? Ben Bradley. Ben Bradley. Oh, oh uh, yes. Uh, ben, ben Bradley, yes. Uh, yes, because he was married to Sally. Um, Quinn. Who, right? Yes, of course, because remember, the Washington Post was the parent company of Newsweek. That's so, why yes. I asked. Yeah, yeah I met them all, yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, by the way, Woodward and Bar Bernstein in those days? Were you not uh, in those days? Although, believe it or not, that was one of my stories I covered for Newsweek because so much of Watergate happened in California. People forget about that. The the Daniel Ellsberg story, uh, San Cle you know, Nixon down at San Clemente. All the Nixon White House crooks were all from California. They all worked and so, yeah. they all and they their all, jobs And I like and, and I'm delighted to point out many of them went to USC. That's Any so of them bad. went to USC, but you know, I mean, it, Ron Ziegler and Haldeman and Erdogan, they always used to work at Disneyland. And, and even Ron Ziegler, the press secretary, until the day he died, could still give you word for word the Jungle Cruise script from That's Disneyland. Amazing. That is so amazing. And too bad somebody didn't uh, document that. That would have been fantastic. Um, 
Peter, we have another question that's kind of interesting. Maybe it goes to your uh, to your uh, to your almost uh, medical career. Um, I have a question. Seeing several people I know have worn masks, still got COVID, including my sister and friend. How did they get this illness when doing everything advised? Thanks. I'm, I know you're not a doctor, but from your perspective as a as a as a journalist, what would you say to her? Well, I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV or on the internet, but I will tell you this: it's about being asymptomatic you know, and testing negative and still getting it. Remember, I, I want to tell everybody this because I just got my first shot about two or three weeks ago. I'm going to get my next shot on April 2nd. But getting vaccinated doesn't mean you're, you've been liberated. It doesn't. You still have to wear the masks. You still need to be tested. And you still have to practice every protocol the CDC is suggesting. We're going to be wearing masks for the next year. Live with it. It's going to be there. Uh, it's going to get better. But look what's happening now. Nobody's paying attention to the CDC. I'm traveling because it's what I do for a living. But nobody's paying attention to the CDC in terms of their vacation travel. They're all racing out to book to book travel. Because as 2 million Americans a day get vaccinated, that's another 60 million every two months. They think that they're free to travel. I would like to think they're free to travel if they behave responsibly. But the bottom line is we're not out of this yet. And we just need to remember that. Uh, uh, wise, wise advice. Um, share, share, uh, uh, had a comment, Peter, where is your life story written? Or should I say, when are you going to write it? She's loving your stories. Well, believe it or not, and I hate to sound self-serving, I'm writing it now. I've been working on it for the last year and a half. It's going to take another year and a half to two years to finish. Uh, I, I have a great title for it. Uh, but you know, when you write an autobiography, you have a choice. You can either do the Laura Bush approach and say, living at the White House is fun, the end, or you pull the pin, you throw the grenade, you name names, because you get one shot at this. So I'm in the process of pulling the pin, and hopefully in the next two years, I'll get a chance to throw the grenade. I will uh, love reading it. Um, Peter, I have a friend named Eddie Sato who uh, spent many years as an Imagineer at Disney, and he was talking about his career, and he told me that... Uh, David, let me explain something to you. Every job has dishes and laundry. Every job. What are the dishes and laundry in your job, Peter? <laughs> well, as I said earlier, I am not on the beach with Robin Leach. I hit the ground running. Uh, I carry with me literally printed airline schedule books and airline tickets because I'm constantly changing. I'm constantly, you know, Travel is news. It is front page news, as we now have experienced during the last 14 months. Uh, and it's not going to go away any, any anytime soon. So the dishes and the laundry is realizing that, you know, sleeping four hours a night doesn't mean you get four hours a night. It means you're all, already on the way to the airport. So I've got wheels up tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., not that far along from now, uh, to fly down to another part of Turkey. And I hit the ground running. People really don't understand uh, what my job is. When I tell them my schedule, then they don't want my job. Uh, and it's a lot of border, borderline, border or borderline negotiations uh, with people who not only, who not only, not always understand what you're talking about. Indeed. Um, Peter, you have, uh, you've been covering an industry that's gone, mon that's uh, gone through monumental shifts and transformations besides uh, you know, COVID. And you also are in the media, which has undergone these uh, enormous transformations. And you still built a brand that has stayed relevant through all of those transformations. How, how was it, was it difficult to do that? And how, how did you reinvent yourself along the way to, to, uh, to keep up with, a, with an extremely dynamic couple of industries, the one you're in and the one you're covering? Uh, it has been difficult and it continues to be difficult because most people inadvertently or mistakenly uh, or delusionally think that travel is about lovely London or beautiful Bermuda. It's not. It is investigative reporting. It is telling people what they need to know. Uh, and not everybody wants to tell you what they need to know. Uh, they just want you to sell travel or promote it, which I don't do. So it's a constant struggle, not just in terms of the people I'm doing stories about, it's a constant struggle within the news organizations that I work for, because they need to understand the importance of it as well. And 
you know, I still have to go door to door like the Fuller Brush Man. That's dating myself too. But I still have to go to door like the Fuller Brush Man and sell my story ideas. There's no slam dunk here. And, and uh, you know, it's, I remember, I'll give you a funny example. About seven years ago, I realized early on because the flight attendants were telling me this, the pilots were telling me this, the counter agents were telling me this at the airlines, that people were absolutely abusing the emotional service animal uh, basically, you know, claim at the airports and taking, you know, everybody on the plane that shouldn't be on the plane in terms of, you know, you know, horses and donkeys and ferrets and snakes claiming that they had to have this emotional support, support animal. Right. Yes. Right, ESAs. And when I started hearing some of these stories, which were documented at that point, because we checked them out, I went to CBS. I said, look, we need to do this story because people are really, first of all, they're not just getting pissed off. They're getting hurt. Flight attendants are getting bitten. Cabins are getting destroyed. Uh, and it's it's becoming a huge problem. And they didn't want to do it. I finally said, look, trust me on this. Let me do this story. And I want to do it my own way and have some fun with it. And they reluctantly said, okay. And here's what we did. But it was a struggle. I, For those of you who don't know this, in the days when emotional support animals were allowed, for $150 online, you got some quack psychiatrist to claim that David Newman was going to snap if he didn't have Fido on the plane with him. And then you get, you get this certificate, you buy Fido this little red vest, and on he comes, or Fluffy comes. Well, what I did is I went to a farm in Pennsylvania, and I rented a pig. And I got the $150 psychiatrist to claim I could freak out if I didn't have the pig on the plane. And we got a really big red vest. And we got it on the pig and we did a story for CBS called when pigs fly. <laughs> and of course, it was the highest, it was the highest it rated segment they'd done on that show ever, uh, other than obviously serious breaking news. And one of the only segments they ever repeated because so many people wanted to see it. So, but the point was I had to struggle to get that story done because, and this is not a reflection of CBS. It's a reflection of all the networks they tend to think of travel as just vacation and deals. A monkey could talk about a vacation and deals. They could just look it up. That's not what I do. So every time I'm doing a story, I'll, I'll give you one more. Uh, most people don't know a cruise ship called the Astoria. I know it because it's its 11th name. But I knew it first by its first name, the Stockholm. The Astoria is the oldest cruise ship sailing in the world. It's 72 years old. But let's go back to 1956. That's the ship that rammed into the Andrea Doria, the largest maritime disaster in modern American history, and sank the pride of the Italian fleet off the coast of Nantucket. Wow. And it took me a long time. But I finally, I couldn't get the network to do the story. So I did it for my regular show on PBS, and we ran it not as a three-minute piece, but as a 15-minute piece on The Travel Detective. And I got to tell you, I'm really proud of that. But it ran as a 15-minute piece because I lost that struggle with the network to get them to do a story that, to me, was so obvious. Interesting. It, it is one of the things that I would imagine for you has improved in the media landscape is there used to be so little, you know, the gatekeepers had such a tight lock on all this information and you had to get through a very, very narrow aperture to get a story out. Now, at least you have other means to do so. Almost. I do. I do. I'm not only on CBS, uh, on both CBS this morning and CBS Sunday morning. I'm also on PBS. I have four shows on PBS, uh, the travel detective, the Royal tour, which you've done now for 20 years. Travel detective is, detective is now going to season seven. A new show called Hidden, which is why I'm in Turkey right now, and one that I can't announce just yet, but it's going to happen. Uh, those are, you know, those are shows that are all news-based driven. I mean, they are, they're information driven. Uh, they are, and they're, and they're, and and I've seen the three that are that are that are that are public, and they're they're outstanding. Peter, you're really doing thanks. amazing work. Um, well, this is an interesting uh, uh, question from a commenter. You and Anthony Bourdain have journalistic jobs in different fields. What is going to protect you from his fate? Oh, dear. Well, let's see. With all, look, he did a great job. No doubt about it. 
And the reason why he did a great job, by the way, and I'll give you the, the background here. I used to be on the travel channel. So did he. And we both left for the same reason, because they didn't understand travel. And they, they were looking for the lowest common denominator for deals. That was not his mon mantra, and it certainly wasn't mine. We, and and, and, and uh, uh, Samantha Brown left at the same time. We all left the Travel Channel at the same time. Anthony went to, to, to CNN. Samantha and I went to PBS. And he did a great job. But the reason why he did such a great job on CNN was because nobody messed with his stuff. It was, it was authentic. It was genuine. Uh, it wasn't really a travel show. It was a political show. It wasn't really a political show. It was a cooking show. But it was a you you couldn't stop watching it because you knew whatever he's gonna say was the right stuff that makes wow. sense. So um, often. So often. Right. Yeah. Such a, to, such answer a your question, yeah. to answer your question about how I avoid that fate, uh, very simple. Uh, I think. Uh, I'm not a drinker, I'm not a smoker, I'm not a drug user. Uh, I, I would like to think I like myself. Um, we all have our demons, but I've dealt with them. It's called Swedish fish, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I overindulge a little. Uh, but the bottom line is, going back to what my mother told me, I continue to stay interested. And as long as I stay interested, I'm not gonna focus on dark stuff. I'm just not. Good for you. Um, Peter, returning to sort of the getting started theme, you supervise a lot of a large team. Uh, you have a number of employees, and I'm sure you have given many, many, many people their career start. Tell us how someone stands out positively and how and why sometimes they don't cut it. Oh, boy. That's a, that's a four-hour seminar, but I'll tell you this. Number one, and I don't want this to sound self-serving, but I look for somebody who's a mini me. I look for somebody who gets up an hour earlier and stays up an hour later, uh, who understands the old school works, right? It's called picking up the telephone and having a conversation. We've lost the art of the conversation. Uh, you know, most of my staff, when they first walk in, they're completely uh, conditioned to think that the web is the answer. They're going to go right to the internet. And, my rule with them is this. If I ask you a question and you come back with a three-word answer and that three-word answer is the web said, you're fired. You need to pick up the phone and talk to somebody and don't come back and tell me you talk to a guy named Vern. I want his first name, his last name, his favorite color, his first sexual experience. Tell me who this guy is and tell me what his what his pedigree is and what his what his, you know, what his portfolio is so I know he's he's telling this the truth, and then verify it with a second independent source. That's journalism 101. I have no idea what they're teaching in journalism school today because what they're teaching in journalism school today, I don't think includes Wikipedia, but somehow it finds its way into the conversation. So that's what I look for for somebody who's really going to advance. Taking, being enterprising, asking questions that are not a list of questions, but part of a conversation. So I'll give you an example. I'm going to ask you a question, David, and whatever I ask you, I want you to say yes. And then I'm going to tell you how most journalism students follow up that question, which is why they don't work for me. Here it comes. Ready? Yes. True, David, that you killed your entire family. Yes. And what's your favorite color? What? They're not listening. They're just asking a list of questions. This is garbage. It's garbage on television. It's garbage in print. It's garbage on the radio, and I won't stand for it. And that's, and by the way, that's non-negotiable, right? So that's what gets them in trouble when they don't do that. You know, I, 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 you've said so many interesting things. I wish I could just take that. I think I'm going to take that 15 seconds and I'm going to post it because I actually see it happening all the time, even with people who should know better and should do better. It astonishes me the way people do not, interviewers do not listen to the answers that are coming from the people that they ask questions of and following up on those questions. I'm not even gonna say it because it would be in uh, poor taste, but there was a very famous interviewer, one of the most famous interviewers in our society and culture. 
who have Lady Gaga on for an interview. And she said, she was giving an answer to something. And she said at the end of her answer, um, well, at that time, also, I was thinking about killing myself. And the next question out of the interviewer's mouth was, so tell us about making the album. And I was just literally like, my well, head was exploding. I was can, like, I, can, I one, can I one up you on that one? Yes. Okay. The interviewer, who I will not mention, got the access to, to General Schwarzkopf during the Iraq War. Right. And this was, uh, and General Schwarzkopf also served in Vietnam, and he served with General William Westmoreland. And you may remember that Westmoreland sued CBS claiming that he was slandered when CBS claimed he was making up the body count numbers in order to prolong the war in Vietnam. The famous Westmoreland case versus CBS. Yes. And this this interviewer said to us said to uh, Schwarzkopf, "You served with General Westmoreland, is that right? Yes. Is it true that you threatened to to completely leave the service because he was dummying up the figures in Vietnam?" And he said, "Yes." And the next question was like, "If you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be?" <laughs> I was about to take a hammer and throw it in this. He, this man just confirmed the entire CBS case against Westmoreland, and she just asked the next question on her list. It yeah. just drove me yeah. nuts. It, it, it's crazy. You know, um, this is a little off topic, but uh, once for very strange reasons, I took a Meisner based acting class. And, um, and what the first exercise they give you is called the repetition exercise. And you simply have to keep repeating what the other person says. And then eventually, once you've sort of graduated from being able to do that, then they allow you to, you can either repeat or you can comment on what the person said or how the person said it. And it, it's a very weird thing to watch and observe, but it's an amazing thing to be inside of as a participant, because I realized that until I've done that exercise, I'd never fully focused on somebody I was having a conversation with. You know, I was in my head thinking about my next question, thinking about, but when you were forced to actually wait and only react on the basis of what you were given, it does two things. First of all, it really heightens your awareness. And secondly, it makes you a much better communicator um, because you are, you, it forces you to stay in the moment with the, with the subject. Um, uh, before we, we're, we're almost out of time, but I have a last question for you, Peter. You're looking at a very interesting and devastated and changed world because of COVID. And like any situation like that, there are probably opportunities in your industry as a result of that. What are opportunities you would point out to young people that exist now that they could take advantage of despite, you know, the obvious terrible stuff that uh, that has happened. Well, I used to say we don't change our lifestyle when we change our location. I'm having second thoughts about that now. As people have changed their location and they've changed their lifestyle, they've changed their work style, they've changed their approach to the office, to the commute, to where they live and how they live, uh, and and essentially how they how they work in a given day. Uh, I have not been back to my CBS office in New York in a year, it was a year yesterday, a year yesterday that I was in my office. That was it. It's been locked down. God knows what's in my office refrigerator. That's the hazmat story of the year. But forgetting that, uh, look what's going on in the cities. Look what's going on outside the cities. Look how people are adapting or trying to adjust or talk about reinventing themselves. So this is a time if you're going to be specializing in journalism, to reinvent yourself and specialize in those kinds of lifestyle stories because people are desperately seeking answers because it's a brave new world for them and it's a brave new world for me. That's awesome, Peter. I want to just point out we're getting so many nice compliments uh, from all over the place. Um, one, one of my favorite here from Sis Scott is, as a career interview producer, all I can say is, all caps, PREACH. Thank you, <laughs> Peter, for that wise advice. Uh, Michelle says, listening is a lost art as well. Um, uh, 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 my friend Peter actually, uh, um, I had another comment here that I have lost. 
Uh, friends of mine were on his Scottish food episodes. He was apparently lovely. I guess that's a conversation probably, and it's a comment probably about uh, Anthony Bourdain. Did you, yeah. to, did you and Anthony Bourdain ever meet and, and chat about, about yeah, what we, you guys do? We did. Um, and uh, But early on, early on when he came up with, you know, Kitchen Confidential and, and, and his first books, I mean, amazing guy. And I, my, my hat will always be off to him that he was able to talk about reinventing himself doing that kind of a show. Just great work. Yeah. Peter, it is a blessing in my life that I've been friends with you for now three decades. And uh, I am such an admirer of what you do. I've learned a lot about you that I didn't know just from, uh, just from this, this interview. And I'm delighted to know it. I think you've passed on some really wise advice to everyone. I want to thank you so much for being so generous with your time. You got it, David. We'll have to get together in person one of these days when the when the gods allow. Well, I, you not only the guy, I'm double vaccinated at this point. I know you're Im imminently going to be, and uh, I'm now fearless. But I'll still practice the protocols, and uh, I look forward to seeing you when you're uh, you're back in uh, Los Angeles. And by the way, if anybody wants to reach out to me, any further questions, you can always go to our website. We are not transactional; we're informational. That's it's awesome. Just, it's just petergreenberg.com. And you can always email me to peter at petergreenberg.com, and we'll be glad to answer it. That's fantastic. Petergreenberg.com. I'm delighted to support it. Thank you again, Peter, for making the time. And I look forward to thank you for uh, to the audience and all the participants for sharing this with us. And I look forward to seeing you next time. You got it. Thanks, David. Take care.